The Gospel this morning is from Matthew. It's chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom is written. See, I am sending my message ahead of you, messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way for you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Lord Jesus, we just pray that you help us to see the way that we can live a life greater than even John the Baptist by living a life in you. And we just ask that you help us to see your plan when ours fall apart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for those of you who were here last week, I was a little bit under the weather. And I had planned on that being a small little bump that I just kind of rode over and went, oh, yeah, there's a bump. And then I keep on going with my plans, and I keep all my appointments, and I do all the things. And I'm happy to tell you that it has been a great week where I've had to cancel all my plans because I've been completely under the weather the entire week. I'm still not feeling great. And I have been so sick. You know, it's one of those things, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I get sick, I kind of think, okay, good news, bad news. Good news is, uh, or bad news is I can't do the things that I plan on doing. Good news is I can do all the things that I haven't been getting around to. I can read the books that I've been having stacked up that I want to read. I can get maybe my house clean. Well, how many of those things do you think I did this week? None. I read two pages. Two pages, and then my head hurt too bad, and I just had to close it and watch more reality TV. So I got a lot done this week on reality TV, and the reason that I'm telling you this is because my wife is sick of me complaining, and because it fits with the message. And the message today is about our plans, or rather, how they don't work out. As they all say, Man plans and God. Someone said ordains. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that one. Laughs is the one I've always heard. He's not that nice. My God usually is not like, oh, I ordain. It's I'm laughing at you as you're making the plans. So that's, and, and here's my goal for this message today. I still want you to make plans. And I still think God's going to laugh at them. The only difference that I want, if I can accomplish anything this morning is for you to be in on the joke a little bit more. Does that make sense? So today the goal is to be in on the joke as we're making plans and God's laughing at our plans so that we can maybe laugh a little bit with him. So as we have heard now, this is the third time, uh, this is the pink week, this is the pink candle week, and I love the pink candle week. This has always been my favorite week. I love pink, and I love pink. You know, this is real men wear pink. You ever heard that expression too? Real men wear pink. That's why I wore a pink shirt today. Okay, I don't own a pink, because what kind of guy would buy a pink shirt? Oh, hey! <laughs> But, uh, but I, you can just think of this as a really manly shade of pink, okay? So I'm wearing a, my, my pinkest shirt today in honor of my favorite. I do really love the, obviously I'm married to pink. You can see her in the back with her hair. 
Uh, so I love pink, and I, I love pink candy. Some of you guys already know this story because I've shared it before, but I love pink Starburst. Anyone else love pink Starburst? No, no flavor is as good as pink Starburst. It's the best flavor, and, and my second is red, the red one, which is I think is cherry, and, and that's cool too. Some people have a different second, but everybody's first is usually pink. So I had this brilliant idea. I emailed the Starburst people. And I told them, you should make an all pink and red Starburst because it's everybody's favorite, pretty much. So I got a response. And I didn't even think I was going to get a response. But I was really surprised by the response because they were mean. <laughs> Their response was basically, um, we've got marketing teams to decide things like that. Thanks, but no thanks. We don't need your ideas. From their customer service department. Whereas I don't know anything about their marketing team, but now I have some suggestions for their customer service department. <laughs> the best part of this story is about eight months later, they came out with a new special edition Starburst called Favorite Reds that was all pink and reds. Yeah, you're welcome. I hope you enjoyed it. That was me. That was all my idea. Thank you very much. So what's funny to me about that is someone read that email and was like, this guy's stupid, but I am going to pass on his idea to the marketing team. It was like, brilliant, let's do it. I, I, I think I owed some money, right? But the other reason why I love pink is because this pink Advent week is because it's different. If you notice, you look over to your right, you see all these purple candles. And then one pink candle that looks like it slipped in when no one was watching. It just kind of like blend in, like just stand there and look like you know what you're doing. And maybe no one will notice that you're the wrong color. And I've related to this. When I was a kid, that's, that's what I was thinking. When I was at church on the pink Sunday, that was like, the happiest Sunday for me for a couple reasons. One was I was just like, I'm the outsider. I'm the pink candle that kind of slipped in when no one was looking and just kind of like, hey, yeah, I belong here too. Has anyone ever felt like that? Felt like they're an outsider and they don't really belong? Well, you have found your right church because this is a church where everyone's pink. And so we're all different colors, especially Guy. He's really getting into the spirit. Thank you, Guy. Um, so the pink week is also special because it's the week of joy. And joy is really important. That's why I had my dad share. My dad and I are very similar in many ways. One of the ways that we are similar is that we're both actually very serious people. We, that wasn't, that wasn't the joke, but thank you. <laughs> we are, we are very serious people. We take everything serious, including humor. It's one of the things we say as Dempsey's, Dempsey's take two things very seriously, God and humor. And so the other thing is, though, we do worry a lot. We worry a lot. So we worry about all the things. It's just naturally, it's, it's, I think it's some, tied to the migraines that we both get. We are worriers. Our, uh, my grandmother, uh, dad's mom, was also a worrier, also got migraines. So it's another thing that I, I think is tied together. And yet we also love to laugh. And our ability to remember to love to laugh has been our greatest, our greatest weapon in the, in the battle of worry. And it's an interesting weapon to use because it's a weapon that has no obvious productive value. W laughing fixes nothing. Laughing does nothing objectively. In the manufacturing idea of life, what is laughter worth? Let me put it another way. Henry Ford, when he is putting his decisions on how to make the most efficient human beings produce the most manufacturing, what did he put as a priority of laughter? Anybody have a guess? Zero. I didn't hear the other one, but it was the same family, so I'll say it's probably similar. Very little, in fact, none. He thought that laughter was something that had no place in the workplace. And so that was one of the things he talked about, is how to get employees to never laugh, to never have fun, 
and to never enjoy anything. How many wants to, how many people want to work for Henry Ford? <laughs> how much you, that's all you care about, Andre. Great. Got a couple jokesters who raised their hand. I, I think that they would just ruin the place. It'd be like the Three Stooges went into Henry Ford's manufacturing facility. They've actually done research, by the way, and they found out that Henry Ford was wrong. That, that laughter actually pr uh, increases productivity. We learn the best when we're laughing, when we're having fun, when we're relaxed, when we're joyous. Just laughing, you guys all want to do it? Want to laugh for a second? <laughs> and that half of you were faking it, but the other half of you heard you, the other people faking it and thought it was funny, so you started laughing. It makes you relax. You remember what you're, you're doing more. And actually, one of my favorite stories was uh, when we were in youth group, we did the Fools for Christ, which is a comedy skit group that my brothers and I and a bunch of other kids in that youth group, we did together. We did these comedy skits based on the Bible. And one day, we, my, my youth minister was teaching on a Bible story, and he was asking this obscure question, and every single kid shot up with their hand because they knew the answer. Why? Because it was in a Fools for Christ joke. That's the only reason they knew it. But they remembered every single thing because we actually would make jokes off the Bible. So they remember these obscure characters' names. Now, some of the facts were not true because there were jokes, and we had to worry about that later, but they remembered. They remembered. And I think that's really cool. So it increases productivity. It, it, it's, it's so good for us to do, and it fights worry. But I want to talk a little bit about my dad because, you know, he did the sharing and everything. And we're talking about similarities and differences. My dad and I are not the same in every way. You might look at him. I mean, you know, very different. I have hair. He does not. I'm tall. He's short. His, his smile is bigger than his whole head. So there's some differences. But uh, another one of the differences is my dad is different than most people. He's kind of just a weird guy. And by weird, I mean insane. This guy is insane. He is a crazy man. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. He hasn't had a donut in like 20 years. He hasn't had a French fry in about the same amount of time. Now, it's not because he doesn't like the French. I don't know if he does or not, but that's not why he doesn't eat a French fry. And it's not because he doesn't like the taste. This guy uses his willpower to not eat the stuff because he knows it's bad for him. What is wrong with this guy? This is not humans and how they act. This is different, okay? This guy, he, he used to, I don't know how much, how far he worked from, or he lived from where he worked, but it was miles, miles. And he was a school teacher. And you know school teachers, they get up early in the morning because school starts early in the morning. My dad used to get up even earlier to run to work with his feet. What, what is wrong with this guy? He would just do that, and then he'd go on lunch break, and he'd run some more because he's just got to show off that he's so energetic and he could do so much. Okay, so the reason I'm telling you this story is my dad has a plan for everything. He has a plan for when he's going to go get gas. You could ask him. I bet he's a plan for when he's getting gas, what day of the week, where he's going to be, so he has extra time, and he's at the cheapest gas station because he's also super cheap. Now, that one we have in common, so I'm not going to make fun of him. Good job, Dad. Be cheap. But uh, on the planning one, I'm not that way. And my dad had a plan for how he was going to raise his children. He was going to raise his children orderly. They were going to have these traditions. They were going to do this thing. And these were the Dempsey brothers were all going to be these nice little soldiers. Now, don't misunderstand me. Yeah, I know. He's laughing already. He knows where this is going. I'm glad that he had that plan. But this is an example of man, plan, God, because he gave us as children. Now, you guys know us. Are we very teachable? As 13-year-old boys? No. No. And there was a time where I think we were all in that teenager. This is the dark, this dark ages. You've heard of the dark ages before? When the Dem6 were all teenagers, that was the dark ages. Now, my dad's plan for us in, in our spiritual development was getting up in the morning and praying. So we get up in the morning. Again, we go to school, so we get up in the morning too early already for human beings. And then we would 
get up even earlier to pray as a family. And some of my brothers were okay at this. This was, this was my prayer posture. Okay, that's how I prayed in the morning. And my dad was a little worried about me, so he would, he would make me stand up so that I prayed standing up so I wouldn't fall asleep. Now, I've heard horses have the ability to fall asleep naturally. I had to develop the strategy, but it was harder for me because I had to look like I was still praying. I like, I kind of like this, you know, so I could c- try to keep getting sleep because human beings are supposed to be asleep then, Dad. I found out years later that my parents were worried that maybe I didn't have that much of a serious relationship with God because I wasn't taking prayer time very seriously, which you should take prayer time seriously, kids. Okay, but what he didn't understand is I just didn't have a good relationship with the morning. I had a great relationship with God. I just didn't like his plan of how to reach out to God. Instead, at the same time, I was going out at night and going on these prayer walks at night and having talks to God when normal human beings do things in the evening. And and my point of saying this is this is an example of man has their plan, their way, their strategy, how they envision things working, and it doesn't really work out that way. Now, with that said, if my dad had no plan of how to raise us, I think that we probably wouldn't be the men that we are today. God absolutely used my dad's plan that absolutely failed. He still used it. I have no doubt that it's not a coincidence that the fact that my brothers and I all love God and love others was partially instilled by our father who trained us in the way that we should go. We all found our own way of doing it, but we all went the general direction that he told us to go in. Now, not all at the same time and not all together, and we kind of crisscrossed and went all over the place before we did, but God absolutely honored my dad's plan. And God absolutely honors your plans. He, they might not happen, but he still uses them. Does anybody watch the A-Team? Did anyone watch the A-Team when they were a kid? Or, or when they were an adult, whatever. Okay, so does anyone still watch the A-Team? Let's be honest here. Okay, only a few. It doesn't get old. Okay, the A-Team has this guy named Hannibal. And Hannibal, this is not Hannibal Lecter. He's a much better guy. Hannibal has a plan. And he's the, the leader. And he always, at the end of every episode, you know A-Team is over when he, Hannibal says, for those of you who watched it, I love it. I love it. Do you, Hannibal? That was your plan? Because this is, now, this is the A-team, okay? There are these specialized military men who all had these military optics specialties that were the best at what they did. And they would take on these gangsters, these local gangsters or something, because some grandma lost her purse. I mean, it was just weird. And then they would end up getting trapped and having nothing to do, but then they had random things in the room And they would just fit these random things together and then use them to defeat the enemy. That was his plan? Your plan was to make a a banana peel launching potato gun to go up against machine gun guys? That was the plan that came together? No, that's not what military people plan on. That's everything went wrong and we had to figure out how to improvise. Well, the eight, that's why I always thought it was a funny line, because it's like, that wasn't your plan. That was improvision, improvising, improvision, improvision, improvisation. Thank you. I was just seeing if you're awake, which is an example of improvisation. The point is that while we do these things in life and plans go askew, we need to improvise. We need to see what God is doing and then go that direction. And the people that struggle are the people that have so much in their mind, and I'm not looking at you, Dad, but so much in their mind of what they expect to happen that when something happens different, they don't adjust. And that's where I'm coming to John the Baptist. We talked about John the Baptist a little bit last week. The thing that it's important to understand about John the Baptist is that a lot of people have him wrong. 
and this is my opinion, it's just my opinion, but they're wrong. John the Baptist is not some wild, crazy man. He lived with aesthetics. He lived with people that were regimented and had all these different plans of how to do everything. And if you look at how he talked, it looks like a planner. He's not this crazy man just going out in the wilderness. He's actually like a monk. And it's a good way to see John the Baptist is as a monk who is telling people how to live because he has a vision and a plan. In that way, John the Baptist is a lot like the Pharisees who Jesus had some run-ins with because they had this idea of where they're supposed to go. The irony of it is their plan for where to go wasn't actually wrong. It wasn't actually bad. You know, I have people say uh, communism works great on paper. You ever heard that before? Anyone saying that? Nobody's heard that? You guys just sick of raising your hand. I've had you do it too much. Okay. I always say not if the paper was a psychology paper. Because if the paper was a psychology paper and they understand the way people work, they'd understand that that just doesn't work. People need freedom. People need choices. People can't be forced into a direction even if you know it's the right way to go. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. They're always trying to force people to go in this direction. John the Baptist was great. Never took a sip of alcohol. He lived a regulated life his entire life. And that was a beautiful thing. And it was beautiful because his job was to prepare people for Jesus. But then imagine him, this guy who lived this regulated, rule-oriented life and told people, hey, listen, you guys aren't following the rules. You need to repent. You need to turn your life. And you need to start living the rules, which is all good and all true. And then he's looking at Jesus, who's this greater guy. Now, John the Baptist had earlier said when his disciples were upset because Jesus was stealing some people away, his disciples were like, we got to stop him. We got to stop this Jesus guy. And he said, no. Jesus has to become greater while I become lesser. And tonight, if all goes according to plan, you're supposed to laugh. Right? I'm going to do a gospel minute video where I'm going to talk about that verse of, of, of God, Jesus must become greater and we must become lesser on my Facebook. If you're not a Facebook friend, Richard Demsick, you can feel free to like me on Facebook. If you don't have a Facebook, you're probably happier in life because that's what statistics have shown. So don't get a Facebook, okay? But if you're in that dark world, at least bring me into it and you have a little bit of light and hope. Okay, but the point is that John the Baptist had already said this thing about Jesus must become greater, I must become lesser, and now he's starting to have some doubts. Because he's, Jesus, he's seeing Jesus, maybe he's hearing the story about Jesus and the woman at the well where she's a bunch of husbands and he's like loving her and he's having a lot of grace for her. He's like, oh yeah, I don't know. I would have smacked her with a few more rules, Jesus. I'm not sure about that call. And the woman that's a prostitute, that there's going to be stoned, and Jesus is stopping her. And he's saying, oh, I don't know. That seems a little off to me. And then he maybe is hearing rumors about Jesus being a drunkard and a, tax, uh, and a glutton, which, by the way, Jesus wasn't a drunkard, but that was his reputation. And maybe he's thinking, wait a second, is this really the guy? Could this be the guy that's supposed to be the greatest better than me because he, he looks like he's playing by different rules and he's doing different things and I don't like this. Now I'm, I, I'll admit I'm putting some, uh, some things in the scripture that aren't super clear. That's just my interpretation. And I always want to be honest with you about that. But that's what it looks like to me of what's going on with, with Jesus and John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist had also said this guy who's coming after me is going to have this baptism of fire. The winnowing fork is in his hand. You know, and it's given this very aggressive image. All those things were true, by the way. But Jesus had a very different approach. And yes, at times he got in people's faces, but it was only the rule-oriented people that were doing the rule-oriented thing. So here John the Baptist is in prison, and he's wondering, what is going on? Now, have you ever noticed that people that are, and I'm glad my dad is not here now so I can talk about rule oriented people. 
But have you ever noticed that rule-oriented people are the people that have the hardest time giving up control? When something isn't in their control, they have the hardest time letting go. And, and because of that, sometimes they, they cause themselves so much stress and pain, which is why I'm coming back to the, the weapon of laughter. When we laugh, we release endorphins, and we, we release control. We're actually giving up kind of control. When I talk, I have a pretty decent amount of control over what's happening. When I laugh, I look stupid. I look like a hyena. Anyone laugh stupid like me? Does anybody else laugh stupid? And it looks super embarrassing. You see a video of yourself laughing. And you're like, right now Andre is showing us that he does. Thank you, Andre, for displaying it. But we all do. We laugh so stupid because we've, like, we've given up control at that moment. And it's so freeing. I have a friend who is also a pretty rule-oriented guy. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Mark, it's okay if you're rule-oriented. Don't <laughs> leave the service. But uh, he's a pretty rule-oriented guy. And my wife and I were having dinner with him and his wife. And he was saying to me, you know, I'm really, I'm really scared about this thought. This thought is really stressful for me. And I'm, well, what thought is this? He's, There's 7 billion people on the planet. He's also a nerd. You'll find this out anyway, so I didn't have to share this. He said, there's 7 people on the planet. And he said, I calculated the time it would take to shake everyone's hand and how long I'd have to live to be able to shake everyone's hand on the planet. And there isn't enough time. I couldn't live that long. That's how you know. So I said to him, yeah, that is, that is a scary thought. Wouldn't it be great if there was something, I don't know what, but something that could be everywhere, knew everyone, and had enough time to not only shake everyone's hand, but properly love every single person on the planet, and we could just trust that thing, whatever it might be, to actually take care of this so it wasn't your responsibility to do so. Of course, he got what I was referring to. God. God does. And see, what Jesus points John to in this story is he points him to like, John, you're looking at what you expected to see. And you're looking at all the things that that's not. By the way, people still do this to this day when they're looking for God. They look for the things that they expect God to do for them or they expect God to look like. And then if they don't see those things, they say, ah, oh, see, there is no God. Instead of looking for all the things that God's already doing. And that's what Jesus points uh, Paul, uh, or, uh, John to. He says, look at all the things that are happening. The blind are seeing. The lame are walking. Right? All, of the, 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 all of these people are being free. I'm freeing the captives, John. Look. I'm doing the work that I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not doing it like you expected. Now, a lot of women, when they got married, they had a lot of expectations for their wedding day because they had envisioned this since they were a kid. Most guys didn't care because the first time they thought about their wedding day was after they proposed. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. We got we to gotta get married, too. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you want to do that thing, huh? Now, I was different in this regard. I had thought about my wedding since I was a little kid, too. But I, it was different than a girl because a girl, most girls, not all, some girls don't even care about that stuff, but most girls, they think about, like, the, the procession where they're kind of walking down. They think about their dress. And think, I didn't care about that. I cared about the wedding reception. I wanted to party, okay? And I had very strong ideas. I'm, and this is true. I even had songs that I told the DJ, if you play it, you are going to have the power turned off and be asked to leave. I also, if anyone clanked their glasses, I had bouncers. I, first of all, we got plastic just to make sure no one could clank. And then if anyone tried anywhere, I had bouncers to ask them to stop clanking or leave the place. That's how much I hate the clanking. Stop the clanking. It's not cute, okay? Just tell us to kiss. We'll kiss. It's fine. I don't mind kissing her. But no clanking. 
Anyway, it's fine if you're a clanker. Don't, there's no judgment here. You can clank all you want. But the point is, that's how much I cared about my wedding reception. I had this vision for it. And I had this vision for it for this specific song that I was going to have played when I danced with my mom. Yeah. I also didn't get, by the way, the dance that I wanted with my bride for our first dance. We had this whole routine plan. It was going to be really funny. Then I injured myself and I couldn't do that. But the plan with my mom was simple. There's this song, um, Que Sera Sera. I mean, people know it, Que Sera Sera. It's in The Man Who Knew Too Much, which is a Hitchcock movie, which is wonderful. If you haven't seen it, pastor your assignment. Laugh and watch that movie. That's two for today. Um, and in that movie, there's this awesome scene where Grace Kelly sings the song Que Sera. It's super moving. I'm not going to go into the details. What did I say? Oh, Doris Day. I said Grace Kelly. Grace Kelly's great, too, and she's in other Hitchcock. Doris Day. Thank you for correcting me. See, I'm just making sure you're paying attention. Okay, Doris Day. Now, Doris Day is, a, sings a lot like my mom, just a little bit worse. It's true. It's true. All right, so anyway, and I, I love my mom singing this song, Que Sera, Sera, to all this. So whenever I'm stressed and I'm worried and I don't know what to do, I'd ask my mom, sing the song Que Sera, Sera. And if you don't know the song, I'm not going to sing it now because I can barely talk, and I can't sing very well according to Rep Palmer, so I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you this. The lyrics in the song are about whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see, Que Sera, Sera. Well, maybe I should have you guys sing it. You guys seem ready to. Um, and it's such a beautiful song when we're in these moments where our plan has just been smashed to smithereens. We're frustrated and we don't know what to do. To just go hear someone who sings better than Doris Day, sing Que Sera, Sera, whatever will be, will be. And it put me at peace. It put me at ease. So I'm really excited. I've got this vision. And uh, then the DJ didn't have the song. Didn't tell me they didn't have the song. Just said, by request, this is a unique song, but this is the song that I'm going to play. I later found out that they didn't have the song. That's why they played this song. Sunrise, Sunset. <laughs> you know, sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset. And it just goes on and on and on like that for about five minutes where I'm supposed to dance with my mom. And it's that song that I, we had the history and everything. So I could have been really upset, like a little girl. I kind of was. But instead, we laughed. We laughed and we danced. And we danced silly and we enjoyed the moment. Now, my wedding didn't go as I planned. It went better than that. It went better than that because it wasn't my plan. See, plans, first of all, they never happen. They're, they're just our imagination. And reality is always better than that. And the other thing is we've got a God who plans a little bit better than we do. Now, sometimes he brings us through some horrible circumstances. And yes, I get it. It's much easier for me to laugh at a bad song. And not that that's a bad song, but the wrong song for the moment played at my wedding day than it is for me to laugh at when I find out someone I cared about just passed away. Or to laugh when I find out that I've got some kind of illness or, or, or that I, I feel betrayed or, or someone's disappointed me. Like those are harder moments to laugh in. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't go through sorrow in those moments when things unexpected and tragic happen to us in our life. It's okay to cry. The Bible says that there is a time to weep. There is a time for mourning. It even says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And, and Jesus cares so much about your mourning, he even cried when he saw someone else mourning because he's that good at empathy. He's that good at feeling your feelings and understanding what you're going through, even though he knows it's all going to work out. There's a story with Mary and Martha where their father had died. And when M Mary starts crying, Jesus sees her crying and starts crying himself. Now, was Mary, did Jesus not know that he's about to heal Lazarus? Of course he knew. 
So why did he cry? He's not mourning. He's about to heal his friend Lazarus from the dead. It's going to be a glorious moment. Why is he crying? Because he loves Mary. And he understands her pain, even if it's momentary. And here's the thing. All the pain that you're feeling, all the pain that you're going through that you think matters so much, it does matter. It matters to Jesus, but it is also temporary. Even the pain that feels like it goes on for years and years and you're struggling for years and years, it matters because it matters to you, it matters to Jesus, but it is temporary. It's just a moment. This life is temporary, it's just a moment. And so our pain is temporary, it's just a moment. And ultimately, it only matters because it matters to us. And Jesus understands it and he comforts us in it. He has empathy, he gets down in us, and he feels that feeling with us. And he goes, I'm here with you in this darkness, in this pain. But I also have some light. And if you're ready, when you're ready, I want to show you this light. This light is so much brighter than this present circumstance that it makes all present circumstances fade away. This light is so joyous and so happy that no matter what your pain is in this moment, you can laugh at it. You can laugh at the pain because you know your tomorrow is in God. See, I want you to be in on this joke. We make plans. Great. We want to get stuff done. Great. Do all you can. But realize there's a limit to how many hands you can shake and how much you can get done. You can help every single person that you can possibly help, and you still are going to just be a blip. But here's the joke. God still reigns. God reigns on high. He's a king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's all powerful. He's all present. And he's not surprised by anything that goes wrong in your plan. And because God is such an awesome God and he's there for you, you can laugh. You can laugh and have joy and release that stress. They did a research on how often people laugh, by the way, and how much people laugh. By the way, women, give yourselves a pat on the back. You are better than men. At laughing and other stuff, but this one, at laughing, you are better than men. You laugh way more often. Now, here's the problem a lot of people have with women that laugh. With them. They laugh at things that aren't funny. Yeah, exactly. Right? Only the women laughed right there. Uh, you know, they laugh at things that aren't even funny. And, and here's the thing. We're the fools for pointing that out. We're like, oh, you shouldn't have laughed at that. That wasn't funny. They're happy now. In fact, one of the things that they found in studying is people laugh most at things that aren't humorous. <laughs> Another exhibit. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so people actually laugh at things that are surprising more than they laugh at things that are humorous. We more often laugh with something unexpected than actually someone who makes a joke. So what does that tell you? That when man makes plans, it shouldn't be only God that laughs. What's surprising and unexpected are the biggest joys in our life. What's surprising, unanticipated, unworked for, as my dad was saying in his sharing, those shocks that come out of nowhere. I'll give you a good example. The gospel reading today. John the Baptist did not see Jesus coming, and his whole job was preparing the way for him. Yet when he came, he was different than John the Baptist anticipated or planned. And if John the Baptist had written the script of Jesus' life, he would have written it, wrote it, he would have wrote it completely different than how Jesus lived it. But what Jesus came and did was a little bit better, no offense, John, than what John could have planned. And likewise, in your lives, the thing that God is writing, 
is far better than the scripts you could have written for yourself. Some of you are gifted writers. But yet, your best script does not compare to God's plan for your life. And we are so bad at knowing what's really going to make us happy. We are also so bad at realizing the blessing that God has given us that we did nothing for. So today, I won't be giving you an assignment. I know. It's even got paper and pen, and I hate paper. I do everything digital. But maybe it's because I was a youth minister for too long before I was a pastor. But I want you all to do this. There's a slip of paper under your chair and a pen. And I want you to give to God. Well, somewhere, I don't know where, but the, sense it. There's a paper around you somewhere. A tree has died. Okay, I want you to write down on this paper as much or as little as you want. If you just put an X on your mark, no one will know. But what you are thankful for God giving you. Something that God gave you in your life this week, this day, or whatever. doesn't matter how recent, but something that God has given you. And I want you to give praise for him and recognize that it wasn't something that you earned. And what we're going to do is after we have communion, we're going to walk over, and there over in the, the corner is our tithing box, and uh, there's a bowl in case that tithing box gets full. But I actually want to put it in the, the little tithing box. And you can put in your tithe if you want to as well. But I want to be really clear about this. One of the commitments we made before we ever started this service is we're never going to ask you for money. Because this isn't about your money. We want you to give what's more valuable, which is your heart. And we expect God to provide. If you want to give, that's great. That's between you and God. That's my perspective. You can disagree with me, and I'd love to debate with you on that. But that's my perspective. But I do want all of us to give something to God this morning. So I want every single person to give something this morning. It's a slip of paper. I want every single person to give to God something that they're grateful for. A little act of worship and praise to him. And to go and put it in the box. Because that's what we do when we're giving to God. We're saying, I'm thankful because I know I didn't earn it. I know you provided it. So we're going to take just a second for you to reflect and think. You can start writing now. But we want you to think about different things in your life. That if you wrote the script you wouldn't have put in there. But it's in there and you're so much better for it. There are things bad in my life, by the way, that I wouldn't have written in the script, but I'm thankful for it. There are things that were hard and painful and hurt that in hindsight, after seeing what God did through it, I'm thankful for it. That might be one of the things you put in there. You're agreeing, oh, amen. Okay, sorry. I thought you were asking a question. Yeah, amen. And there's some silly things in there. Hey, this is the week of joy, so put some funny things in there if you want. My cat, by the way, is one of them. I was look, looking at my cat. It was my, my companion in my sickness this week. And I was looking at my cat, and I was thinking about, I don't know very well what makes me happy. And I've been, I've been talking about this a lot lately. I never wanted a cat. I don't like cats. I love that cat. That cat is like the only one there for me in my sickness. No offense, Kate. The only one. <laughs> She's right behind me. <laughs> but there, you know, she doesn't want to be around me because she's worried she gets sick. But that cat, she jumps right on my lap. She doesn't care. And she loves me, that cat even more than she loves her.
that's a blessing from God. Because we didn't ask for her. She just came up, showed up, wouldn't leave, and eventually my heart melted. These little ones here are a blessing from God. Bring them on in. Are you going to bring them in? Uh, these little ones are coming in. These are blessings from God too. And some of us parents don't tell your kids, but you didn't plan on them either, huh? But they're blessings from God that you didn't do anything to deserve. You might think you made them, but God made them, so they're totally their own. Let's pray.